Greetings and welcome to another Village Soup interview. Uh, I'm Dan Dunkel. I'm the news director for Village Soup. And with me today is Jeff Evangelos. He's a representative and an independent from uh, Friendship, and you're serving in the 129th legislature. Thank you so much for being here today, Jeff. And thanks for doing these interviews, Dan. It uh, helps uh, get information out to the public about what our, our Knox and Lincoln County delegations are doing um, in Augusta. And <clears throat> it's important uh, disclosures and information for people to know what's going on. So. I appreciate you doing this. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I guess uh, we can launch right in. I mean, you've really been kind of busy and you've got quite a list of bills. And, uh, you know, I've sort of been looking at some of these. And uh, so I think the first one we could talk about is kind of an interesting issue is the uh, it's the one that affects the main uh, Native Americans and the uh, land that at one time, I guess, they had uh, claimed two thirds of the state. And there was a settlement in 1980, and you're putting forth an act now to clarify uh, some of that. Can you kind of tell us why we need an act like that and what, sure. what the whole issue is? Well, <clears throat> as many people know, our, um, our relations, Maine's relations with its uh, Native American uh, tribal nations um, have hit a serious low. Um, uh, two, two thirds of the uh, Native Amer American delegation walked out of the legislature, I believe it was in 2015, because Governor LePage um, didn't honor prior commitments uh, that were made uh, to the tribes. But what happened in the late 1970s, um, the Passamaquoddy Nation uh, won several lawsuits, uh, and uh, the federal courts ruled that um, because uh, the treaties uh, with our Native nations in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s weren't uh, weren't ratified properly, that um, the tribes actually owned, uh, still own two-thirds of the land uh, that all of our houses and residents were sitting on, uh, you know, including Bangor and uh, places north. So um, created a very difficult and impossible situation. Um, negotiations were entered into. Uh, the federal government got involved uh, because Maine, the state of Maine refused to put a dime in um, to help uh, resolve this. And uh, they came up with a, uh, the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act of 1980 at the federal level and then um, enacted uh, in 1980 in Maine, the Maine Implementing Act, which sort of implemented the, uh, the intent. But what happened was in the process that <clears throat> unlike the relationship that tribal nations have in the other 49 states, Maine's Native American uh, nations um, were not granted the same rights that the tribes have in other states. And uh, <clears throat> they were only conferred uh, uh, minor municipal powers. And although this has nothing to do with gambling per se, um, it manifests itself uh, to the public. I think the public will recognize that um, when they go to Massachusetts or Connecticut, um, there's gambling casinos on Native American lands. And those tribes down there don't have to ask the state permission. Uh, to because they're sovereign nations, they're sovereign nations. And uh, this bill is going to uh, demand that Maine recognize uh, the sovereign, federally mandated uh, sovereign nation status that the tribes in the other 49 states recognize. Let's keep in mind that <clears throat> we've had four or five votes on um, allowing casinos to operate in Maine. And uh, uh, we voted twice uh, for the white folks and uh, voted yes both times. Um, uh, we voted several times on Native American casinos, at least once by referendum. And, both times we said no. Now these casinos were going to go on Native American lands. I don't understand why our people in the state voted no, but you know, obviously there's a there's a race component to this. Um, there is some very disturbing uh, background regarding our relations uh, with our Native nations in Maine. We were the last state in the Union to recognize their right to vote. It was 1967. <clears throat> That's a shameful legacy. Um, we went through a period of time where uh, <clears throat> there children were stolen from them and put in white homes uh, um, and Maine went through a truth and reconciliation process the last three or four years but again uh, what what was the purpose of that policy why would that be something that we that people would do Maine, the state of Maine made a, uh, a judgment based on race that the our Native Americans mothers and fathers weren't fit parents and they oh. acted accordingly and um, they removed many, many Native American children from homes. They were sent to white foster homes. Um, and one of the International Conventions of Genocide names uh, the, um, uh, Article 6 in that convention is the forced removal of uh, youngsters from their, from their culture and their homes. And uh, that's exactly what happened here. 
Um, we have to keep in mind also that you know around 1600 there were there were tens and tens of thousands of uh, members of our Native American nations in Maine. Uh, by 1900, there were 900 left. That's all, and uh, that's through disease, war, uh, policies of quite frankly genocide. So we've <clears throat> we haven't come far enough in reconciling these differences. Um, the tribal nations, I'm working with them with uh, representative uh, callings and representative Rena Newell of the Passamaquoddy Nation, who is the only um, uh, member of our tribal nations attending the legislature at this point, trying to um, reconcile these differences and, and force the state um, to recognize their sovereignty um, so that they can engage in the economic development and uh, manage the Penobscot River, for instance. Now this business with the Penobscot River where the, our governor and uh, former attorney general and uh, now the head of the DEP, uh, Mr. Reed, um, they were contesting the Penobscot's right to manage the river uh, on their lands uh, north of uh, Bangor. <clears throat> I want to make something clear. Um, the Native American nation, the Penobscot nation, has stricter standards than the state of Maine for managing that river because they do sustenance fishing. Uh, they, they want the river to be extra clean. <clears throat> so there was no environmental or practical reason why we were contesting their management of the river, other than to uh, perhaps uh, protect the right of heavy industry to continue polluting. Um, I, I've never figured out why we were making such an issue of that, when in fact uh, the Penobscot Nation has a, main, a man named Mr. John Banks. He's the environmental steward of, of the river. He's internationally recognized as an expert, and uh, we should have honored the work they're doing on the river instead of contesting it. So that is, you know, it is, it's, it's around the management of their resources. Um, they're not able to engage in the kind of in economic development that the tr tribal nations are in other states. Um, every one of these uh, geographic areas in the other states where the tribal nations engage in these economic development initiatives, there's a, there's a mini boom in the area, and it just doesn't, help, just doesn't help uh, the tribal nation people. It helps the economy uh, in the surrounding towns. They employ a lot of people. It generates a lot of tax revenue. So. Uh, we want to move in a direction where uh, they are tribes in Maine. It's the Maliseets, the Micmacs, the Passamaquoddies, and the Penobscots, the, the four remaining nations, um, are granted nation-state status within our state and are free to govern themselves, as is happening in, in the lower 48. <laughs> and then this, and it, one of the, the big <clears throat> areas where we'll actually see a policy shift would be that they would be allowed to open casinos without permission, and so that could be... It could be seen somewhat as a pro-casino bill, couldn't it? Well, it, what it will allow them to do is to have self-determination on their own land. And uh, whether it's uh, to whatever type of businesses they want to operate, that's their business. I mean, gambling could be one of it, but it's not. I'm not making gambling the focus of the bill. Um, and I, I think that previous attempts to just have narrowly focused issues that, you know, an act to allow this tribe to do gambling um, creates not only discord between the tribes, but it's, it's not the solution. We need a big picture solution to solve the sovereignty issue. And once the uh, Native nations in our state are recognized as sovereign nations, um, uh, it'll, it'll cure all the problems. There's another uh, concept that the United Nations, um, um, uh, they issued a report on indigenous nations, and uh, they made an interesting uh, um, claim in that report is that Sovereignty is something, it's, it's, invo it's inviolable, it's, it's not negotiable. You can't just say, you know, we've taken your sovereignty away. It doesn't work that way in humanity. Uh, people do retain their sovereignty whether other people say you don't have it or not. So, um, and I think uh, if you sit down and talk to the, uh, the tribal elders and the chiefs, they will point that out to you that um, they don't recognize Maine's control over them, even though the courts and the state of Maine's Attorney General's office has been pressing it. Um, they think that sovereignty is not a negotiable concept. That's something I plan on uh, introducing in the hearing when I testify for the bill. Okay. What kind of support do you see this getting? Well, um, it had a lot of support um, in terms of uh, members of the legislature I'm talking to. Um, there is a huge uh, um, uh, draft towards uh, wanting to uh, fix this problem. Um, uh, Governor LePage made it so much worse by canceling long-standing executive orders 
um, that recognize uh, Maine's tribal nations as equals to the state of Maine. And one day he, uh, he got mad and uh, uh, ripped up the agreement. I have the stuff in my files if you, if you want to see them. Um, and, uh, and that was the day that uh, the Passamaquoddies and the Penobscots walked out of the Maine legislature. By the way, folks, um, uh, we, there were three representatives in the Maine legislature, but uh, our Native American members of the Maine legislature are not allowed to vote. They, they sit there and listen. And, um, they can testify hmm. and, and uh, make speeches from the floor, but when it comes time to press the button and vote on an issue, um, they don't have that right, and that's, that's something else that needs to be uh, looked at. Okay. Um, moving on, one of the other things that I saw among your list of bills was that uh, you'd like to see an independent review um, board of some kind instituted in incidents of police shootings. Can you tell us a little bit about what this bill would do and why you think we need it? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, Maine's batting a thousand. Um, we've never admitted in the history of the state of Maine um, the fact that the police were ever responsible for uh, shooting somebody um, that was unjustified. We've always said that they're justified. And the only standard in Maine is that all the police officer has to say is, I felt threatened. Now, we've had some very serious incidences um, where uh, some of the people have been unarmed. You see this around the country. The most serious case was in Waldoboro, um, the Gregory Jackson case. 18-year-old boy um, took five bullets in the back, one execution style to the back of the head, and uh, it was rule justified. And uh, we're investigating that case right now uh, as part of this bill. And uh, uh, I'm sure that um, uh, people will be coming forward to testify. But we need uh, some of the states now, and I saw last week Newfoundland, the province of Newfoundland also adopted it. Um, we can't have uh, the police investigating the police in this case. It's just a monumental conflict of interest. Um, you have to have an independent panel. And is that how it is now? It's basically the decided by office, other police? Yeah. yeah, the Attorney General's office investigates all police shootings. And the Attorney General's And office. you feel like they don't feel a separation between the Attorney General's office and police departments? The Attorney General's office is the police office. Police Department. They're, um, they wear badges. They're, they're, they're law enforcement. They're, okay. they're law enforcement's um, uh, legal team. Um, the largest legal firm in the state um, is the Maine Attorney General's Office. Okay, um, they have a huge, a huge staff, and and they uh, they provide uh, prosecutors for all murder cases. All murder, all murder cases are tried by the Attorney General's Office. Mm -hmm. So they they are the prosecutorial arm for law enforcement. Um, so the Attorney General's office is a law enforcement agency, and they are investigating uh, law enforcement police shootings. And uh, other states are adopting uh, independent review boards because we have found, you see um, these films on TV, and these African-American men, you know, with their hands up, you know, are running away in fear, and they're just unloading on them. Um, we've seen the films. Um, and, uh, you know, we can't have that going on in my state. And, uh, and we have had these incidences. We've just uh, witnessed uh, two days ago um, a family from Vassalboro filing a lawsuit against the Vassalboro Police Department because the Attorney General's office uh, said the shooting was justified. Um, well, the woman sitting in the car, uh, the spouse or companion to the man that was, was killed by the police, they killed her too. She was totally unarmed. She hadn't done anything. And they ruled it a justifiable. And they said uh, her killing was an accident. Sorry. Well, you know, that's just not good enough. You know, you have to, in these cases, uh, the police have to get negotiators in there and attempt to defuse the situation. You know, we've had these cases where they don't even wait five or ten minutes. And, uh, and you know, you, and if they have to fire their guns and they feel threatened, um, maybe they could shoot to wound them instead of, you know, they're always getting killed. Um, the recent case... Um, in another town, I think it was Fairfield, um, the local police departments just settled uh, a lawsuit. They paid. Um, so the settlement, you know, recognizes that something was wrong, but the Attorney General's office ruled that case justifiable. But the police department was willing to settle it with the family. Um, so we have s some very serious cases. Um, uh, we've had a lot of uh, commentary by respectable uh, attorneys around the state that there's a, a, a terrible need for an independent review. Who, who would make up this, this board? Like, how, how would they be independent? Uh, the suggestion I've made uh, is that there'll be seven members of the board. It would be comprised of two members of the Attorney General's office, one member of the Maine Sheriff's Association, 
uh, one member of clergy. Uh, I've suggested interfaith Maine um, because um, they represent all faiths, uh, Christians, uh, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and it's an organization in Portland. Uh, two members from the Maine Criminal Defense Lawyers Association and one uh, human rights organization it could be the ACLU or NAACP. Those are the suggestions I'm making to the committee. So it'll be a, a committee of seven. So law enforcement would still have a chance to law, have a voice in law it. Law enforcement, the Attorney General's office will still uh, have two members. The Maine Sheriff's Association will have a third member. Um, and, uh, and then the, the clergy, I, I put that in there just to um, sort of, maybe they would be the tiebreaker, you know. I don't know. Uh, one human rights organization, um, you know, the ACLU often tries these cases in other states. And then um, um, the main criminal uh, defense lawyers, um, it's important that they have two seats on the panel. Uh, what, what kind of response are you getting to this bill? Getting a fantastic response. Uh, I've even talked to some, uh, a couple of law enforcement people uh, at the state and uh, they said, that, you know, they don't see a problem with it either. Uh, um, just, you know, uh, nobody connected uh, here locally, but just people I see in the hallway and, you know, they said they think it's a good idea. Um, because the people in our state, you know, they lose faith uh, when we see an unarmed man um, gunned down um, in the Jackson case trying to run into the woods. Um, and, uh, you know, he's 18 years old. He's trying to run into the woods, you know. It was 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning. I mean, let him run in the woods and you know, go home and call his parents in the morning and say, you're always out in the woods. Um, you know, I'll be over to your house to visit and, and to follow up on the rest of it. <clears throat> but, I mean, um, the, the parents in this case receive a phone call at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Your son is dead. Mm -hmm. That's not good enough. You know? And then, you know, this is a very, very um, well-documented case. Widely reported, highly controversial. It's not the only one, but I think the findings in the Jackson case um, exemplify the need uh, for an independent review board. Um, there, was, there was a lot of conflict of interest in the Attorney General's investigation of that. Um, the police officer who uh, fired uh, the bullets um, was not, uh, he was a reserve officer. He was not, had never been to the Criminal Justice Academy, uh, wasn't really authorized to be serving as a police officer. Uh, his reserve officer time had expired. When that happens, uh, you're supposed to tell them that, well, you, until you go to the academy and get your credentials, uh, get licensed as a police officer, we can't use you anymore, but um, they have a waiver provision. Uh, and the waiver, you send the, the towns and the police departments, they send the waiver to the attorney general's office. The same people who signed the waiver to allow this police officer to continue to serve are the same exact people who conducted the investigation. Now that is a monumental conflict of interest. And that's going to be brought out in my testimony and, and, and others. I, I believe that one's going to gain some attention. Um, the, uh, one of the other things, and I think in a way this is almost related, you, some of your bills are dealing with how we treat prisoners and, and you've been talking about possibly compensation for uh, people who are unjustly imprisoned mm -hmm. and a look at the reviews of post-conviction mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. Can you talk about, is there a change that you'd like to see in our prison system and, and why, are, why is this important to you? Well, it's not so much uh, about the prison system. It's about uh, what goes on in the prosecution, uh, in the courts, and once you're convicted. And uh, if I can take a minute here, um, the, why I really got going on this was um, the Anthony Sanborn case and uh, the Vladek Filler case and the Jonathan Carey case uh, in the last um, 18 months. Um, three specific cases of um, innocent people um, having been found uh, innocent uh, after they were convicted and served their prison term. Um, you know, that's not good enough. Uh, we can't have one uh, person in prison, folks, who's innocent. And uh, so the post-conviction review bill will uh, somewhat liberalize uh, Maine's post-conviction review standard, which is pretty well narrowly defined that you have to bring uh, new evidence regarding DNA to get a hearing. But other evidence, it's very, very difficult um, to get a new hearing uh, with other evidence. Other states have adopted this principle of actual innocence so that 
if new information comes forward, um, you can get a hearing. I mean, when we look at what happened to Anthony Sanborn, 26 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit, uh, he was just released uh, in 2017, and then the Attorney General's office uh, wouldn't recognize the findings in the court. The, the three witnesses against him all recanted. Uh, they said that the police um, had uh, badgered them into uh, fingering him. Uh, they were teenage girls at the time. Um, that the exculpatory evidence uh, that would have cleared Mr. Sanborn was in one of the Portland police officers' attic for 20 years. A chain of custody of evidence uh, uh, issues. So the evidence is hidden in an attic of a police officer and the witnesses uh, all recanted. And the Maine Attorney General's office uh, still fought his release. And, uh, you know, that's not okay. Uh, Justice Wheeler, who heard the case, uh, even said in the court transcripts, you know, I want to apologize to you today, Mr. Sanborn, but I can't. I, I can't apologize to you yet because the state is still, still wants to prosecute you. They, 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 they were going to prosecute him a second time. Hmm. Um, the Filler case, uh, an interesting case, um, this young man, uh, I think it was down near Ellsworth, um, served 21 days in the slammer for a crime he didn't commit. Um, the witnesses uh, against him lied. The prosecutor um, committed seven uh, serious offenses of the bar, um, telling the police not to disclose critical evidence that would have cleared him uh, to the defense counsel. She was, uh, she was sanctioned for it, and, and as they say here, they, um, the Board of Overseers uh, of the main bar determined that uh, Kellett, which was the prosecutor, violated seven bar rules in prosecuting Filler's case. And as, so Filler filed a lawsuit, um, which is going to lead to your second part of your question. Um, and he won a $375,000 judgment. So that leads to the other piece. So, so what happens to these people who uh, were innocent and served their time, and then we finally recognize uh, uh, that, uh, you know, uh-oh, we've made a mistake, um, they didn't do it. Maine doesn't have a compensation fund. I just saw on CNN uh, last week, I think the guy was in Louisiana, 39 years for a crime he didn't commit, and um, Louisiana has a compensation fund, and, uh, you know, it was an astounding amount, you get $22 million. Uh, my, my bill is modest, it calls for, uh, if you're in prison for 20 years for a crime you didn't commit, and then you're exonerated, um, right now, the law requires the burdens on that person to file a superior court lawsuit against the state and try to collect damages. Very difficult. Why should the burden be on the innocent person? So my bill creates a compensation fund. I think it's twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars a year for each year you serve. So if it's twenty years and it's thirty thousand a year, you get six hundred thousand. I mean, that's not a lot for ruining someone's life, but we have to start somewhere in recognizing. Um, that um, we have to take responsibility for when we get it wrong. And that's not to disparage our legal system, our law enforcement officers, or our prosecutors, who most times do get it right. But they don't get it 100% right. And you know, there's a problem in Maine with accountability on a lot of levels when it comes to this. Um, I see these images uh, once a month on television where Normally, this case I just mentioned to you in Louisiana was, uh, it, was a, it was a white man, but normally it's an African-American man down south. And um, the image is at the, uh, the top of the courthouse steps. And the guy comes bounding out of the courthouse. He's been exonerated. And on his left is his defense counsel. And on his right is the prosecution. And they come out and do a press conference. And they say, you know, today we got it right. That's never happened in Maine. We never come out the prosecution side and say, you know, we were wrong, but today we got it right. We always, always maintain that uh, we got it right even when we're wrong. And that has to change. Uh, it's the same thing with the police shootings. We have never, in the history of the state of Maine, held a police officer accountable. Uh, we're batting a thousand. Um, they ought to, you know, they ought to go into the Major League Baseball business. They're making a billion dollar salary because they never strike out, you know. Well, all right. Well, I think that, again, that's going to be uh, something that gains a lot of attention, and I think a lot of people will be interested to see uh, that uh, well, one that of the bill. One of the, I have taken on some uh, very uh, compelling and big picture issues, but part of it is because of my, um, you know, my, my degree work in the past. And my, you know, I'm a documentary historian, and I study things very carefully, and uh, um, so I'm aware of these injustices, and I decided to bring them forward. So, 
Um, uh, can I bring up another bill that will affect us locally? Certainly, go ahead. Well, I, we have filed a bill. Um, I have uh, to clarify uh, who owns the main intertidal zone. And this is uh, clearly a, a very important bill regarding um, the working waterfront. Um, and I, when people ask me to explain it, it's really who owns, who owns the land from the high tide mark to the low tide mark, where we clam um, and, and sunbathe. Uh, and do all these other activities. Um, during the Industrial Revolution, we had wealthy families, and this is the way I explain it to people to get them to understand it. Um, we had wealthy families move into the area, the Rockefellers, the Wyatts, um, became large landholders and uh, landholders. And they would look out their back window and they would say, uh, look, there's somebody out there clamming or somebody out there sunbathing. And they'd run and get a paintbrush, you know, and they would do a, a great master painting. But in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, Daddy Warbucks has moved in and they look out the back window and they say, get off my land. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're managing access uh, to our coastal tracks in the intertidal zone, um, one lawsuit at a time. And that's not a way to manage our resources. Uh, there was a famous case down in Southern Maine called the Moody Beach case, which uh, um, uh, has been forced, I think it was a four to three decision by the Maine Supreme Court, a very contested decision which said that the private uh, landowner um, held title to the land. But that decision went against uh, Maine's sovereignty clause in its uh, constitution when it was established in 1820, which clearly stated that uh, Maine had right. So I want the bill um, will force, the, for one thing, force the Attorney General's office to enter these cases where you have wealthy, very deep-pocketed individuals filing lawsuits against beachgoers or, or others um, contesting their right uh, to be on their, what they claim is their property. I want the Maine Attorney General's office to come in and defend those cases and, and so that, you know, clam, well, clamors have the right to clam even, uh, even though they, they, the, uh, the Moody Beach case said that they didn't uh, own the land. But um, sunbathers and the others, uh, you know, People without deep pockets shouldn't have to spend all their money and resources defending these cases against these wealthy people. So I want the state of Maine to assert the fact that, hey, the state owns this land. It holds it in trust for everyone to use. And uh, so it's, it's a critically important bill to protect our working waterfront um, so that uh, Maine's people can uh, continue to uh, uh, fish uh, lobster. Um, and, and harvest other marine related resources and um, it's important to the tourism industry that um, people have access to the beaches. We, we've seen a lot of these uh, disputes in uh, mid-coast Maine and so do you think your bill would possibly cut down on the number of lawsuits because I think that's one of the issues too that we've had is oh, that yeah. you know they they become these uh, kind of ongoing issues in some small communities right. and it takes up a lot of time and energy that uh, right well what what the uh, the courts uh, said uh, post Moody Beach decision is that um, um, we're, we're dealing with these, uh, these cases, uh, one court case at a time, but uh, because of separation of powers, there are other, there are other remedies. And uh, we have three branches of government, uh, the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislative branch, and each branch has uh, inherent powers. Well, the legislative branch is the branch that you go to to fix these things. So yes, absolutely, if, uh, if we can get this passed, uh, I think it's game over for these lawsuits. Uh, they no longer will have a, a case to make. Uh, what, what kind of support are you seeing for that? Well, I think we're gonna see a lot of support uh, amongst the uh, fishermen and the clamors and uh, you know, um, other harvesters. And, and lawmakers, do you think that they might uh, pass this? Early indications are there, uh, they are, yeah. Uh, I think uh, there was a bill that um, got creamed in uh, one of the committees last week. Um, Somebody introduced a bill that would have made it against the law to allow um, small vehicles, pickup trucks, and four-wheelers uh, to drive on the intertidal zone. Well, you know, the clamors have to, you know, haul their stuff in, you know, um, and it's heavy, and uh, nobody's abusing it, but this bill would have said you can't, uh, you can't put your vehicles on the intertidal zone to, to bring your harvest in. So that bill got absolutely creamed, and uh, so that, that's why I'm optimistic that people have woken up to the issue. Um, this, this is a, a, there's a lot of highly competent legal minds in, in the state, including Professor Orlando DeLogue, uh, who taught for 30 years at the University of Maine Law School. 
He's written a book about it, uh, asserting that uh, the intertidal zone belongs to Maine's people and the state of Maine, and uh, uh, that we have to uh, assert it. And uh, he recommended in the book that we seek a, a legislative uh, review of it. And uh, I think once we get, if the bill does pass, um, I think most of the lawsuits will come to an end because the, the people filing the lawsuits now are going to be up against the state of Maine, not up against uh, John Q. Public, uh, you know, group of people that want to sit on the beach. Um, so it's, it's an extremely important bill for the working waterfront and for our tourism industry. And uh, so, uh, and again, it's another big picture bill, but it affects my local communities. All right. Are there any other big priority items that you'd like to talk about for this, uh, this session? Well, I've, I've got a couple of bills people might be interested in that um, probably not on as a serious level, but I have introduced a bill to require our cable TV uh, companies to offer a la carte um, programming. You know, when I go to Moody's Diner um, for breakfast, my wife, uh, she buys the uh, blue plate special. She gets the scrambled eggs and the pancakes and the, the bacon all on one plate. She takes the 70 channel package. I order uh, an order, side order home fries, a side order of sausage and a muffin. Uh, so, you know, so in comparison, um, why should I have to buy 70 or 80 channels when I only watch 10 of them? You know, I want to watch the Red Sox. I want to watch Nesson. But when I flip around, you know, folks, I don't want to watch Jimmy Swaggart, you know. Um, I just, I've had enough of him, and um, I mean, he's 80-something years old. He's still singing, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just an example. I don't think we should be forced to buy something. It's the only industry I know of where we're forced to buy something that we don't want. You go into the grocery store, you, it's all a la carte. You buy what you want. Uh, so <clears throat> the FCC passed a bulletin. I believe it was in 2013, saying, uh, I, have, I have it in my files, but it's uh, it, to quote, they say, there is, there is nothing in the FCC regulations that prevents a cable TV company from offering a la carte channels. And let's be clear about something. They're doing it when it suits them. They want to do a pay-per-view on a boxing match. Uh, they offer you H HBO on a standalone basis. They're already doing it. I introduced this bill in 2013. I got creamed in the committee. It was 10-3 against, I think, <laughs> and I got creamed on the floor because the cable TV industry, um, they fought me. And uh, they got they got to the people. They feel they're the powerful. Yeah, they have, well, of course they are. They're multi-billion-dollar corporations. But when I testify this time, I'm going to face off with them in the committee room, and I'm going to remind them that you know 1.5 million people um, in, in Time Warner alone have cut the cord, and you know the kids are they're on their gadgets. And they know how to work around it. They're getting they're getting their programming on their computers and devices now. I don't know how to do that, so I'm. I'm using a, a 70 channel package, but so yeah, I, I want that one. Uh, I also introduced um, a bill to, uh, they're doing it in the other states, it's sweeping the nation. Uh, I don't think uh, this is a fun bill, it's, it doesn't have any uh, negative ramifications as long as people do it responsibly, but I introduced a bill to allow sports gambling in Maine so that, you know, you want to put 10 bucks on the Patriots. Uh, you, you can um, go on, it'll be an online or it will allow our existing casinos the main harness racing tracks, the off-track betting locations, and our five locations in our tribal nations, all to offer uh, uh, sports betting. So are you so, just a, a pro-gambling uh, uh, lawmaker? I mean, it's, there seems to be a theme running through some of these things. Well, no, the sovereignty issue uh, only it manifests itself. You know, I think people, people don't understand the Native American sovereignty issue, but when you bring up how come white people can have casinos and Native Americans can't, so that's well, a, why, why yeah. the sports gambling, though? Why is Be, that because important I'm, enough because, to prompt a bill? Because the, uh, it's happening uh, in it's New Jersey's already got it. Uh, Massachusetts is close. Uh, Rhode Island's already got it. And uh, the revenue that the state has collected in my bill is um, I've directed all of the revenue to go to 55% funding for education. That's why I did it. Because uh, people are gambling all the time. Friends are gambling. They're in these football pools and, you know, fantasy stuff. And, you know, I don't do any of that. But... Uh, um, and friends bet amongst friends on, on games. And uh, so I just thought that uh, I think 22 states have, have already done it or are looking at it. And uh, so I said that uh, this is a good way, uh, a good harmless way to ra raise revenue for our education. So um, that's all. You know, um, not so much about gambling, but creating a new uh, uh, tax fund stream uh, to help the state achieve its 55% uh, commitment. Let me take a quick look at the list here. Sure. Um, um, let's see.
Uh, Representative Kluker and I have uh, introduced bills um, uh, requiring the state to um, honor its commitment to the towns for municipal revenue sharing. Uh, Governor's Mills budget uh, fell far short of, of the commitments that have been made. Um, current law um, folks had the uh, revenue sharing going back to 5% effective uh, July 1st of this year, but um, Governor Mills only funded it at 2.5%. Um, and we also have bills uh, dealing with the 55% education, and uh, uh, we also have a bill um, for the Medicaid expansion honoring the commitment that our voters weighed in on with 59% positive vote. Um, that bill probably will, uh, may not even be required to have a hearing because Governor Mills um, um, has already instituted it. So. On, on some of the taxation issues, I think that's a really important thing to talk about uh, often because I think that there was a lot of discussion during the uh, LePage era that, you know, basically the state was doing a good job of, of cutting its budget. But a lot of times these things aren't really tax cuts to taxpayers. They're just tax shifts. The so, tax it's, shifts, right. you know, it doesn't go to the, uh, you know, there, it's whether you want to pay for it through your income tax based that's on right. how much you earn or that's your right. property tax. That's right. And that's, that was the, uh, it's a shell game. Uh, that's what uh, the governor did. And incidentally, the governor, Governor LePage never cut the budget. What he did was uh, <clears throat> reoriented the um, the revenue stream. So it's it's the old shell game. He he cut taxes for the wealthiest people in this state, and uh, made up for it with cuts in revenue sharing and aid to schools, which shifted uh, mom and pops um, on fixed income on social security. Uh, it forced their property taxes higher, and uh, as you know, the income tax is the progressive tax. And I just don't understand why the wealthiest people got a tax break. And then people making a, a 800 bucks uh, a month on Social Security had to pick up the difference with higher property taxes. That it, I've said it before, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and I was disappointed in Governor Mills's budget that she didn't address um, that inequity. She did step up the aid to education. Um, the revenue sharing wasn't dealt with appropriately. And um, there was no increase in income taxes for people making over $250,000. And I really think uh, I hope that the taxation committee will be addressing this. Sometimes it seems too like there's this almost this competition, you know, so that you have like the feds want to balance their budget so they shift stuff down to states. The mm -hmm. states want to sh balance their budget so they shift things down, you know, roads that the states used to take right. care of, now we have to do State bonds at local. Right. You know, all these shifts go yep. down to the local level yep. and then your school your school taxes go up and the next thing you know your property tax. So if you buy a house for $30,000 in, in 1970, yep. you know, and then you're retired, you know, even the, your property t yeah, assessment has gone up every yeah, year it, and your taxes it, have gone up every year. taxed off your property because yeah. of the shift you're talking about. It's, it's simply not fair. It's a shift from progressive taxation to regressive taxation. But uh, just uh, one minor correction in that, though, um, the feds have never had a balanced budget uh, since uh, who? Uh, maybe Jimmy Carter. Um, I mean, Trump just ran it up a trillion dollars a year. And uh, funny, uh, uh, he runs up those kind of numbers. And, and the fiscal conservatives, the Republicans, they they don't have a they don't have a word to say about it. You know, and I'm not I'm not lying to you about this, folks. Um, President Trump's uh, deficit uh, this past year was one trillion dollars, um, beating out President Obama's uh, eight hundred billion. Um, you know, but the, the feds do shift costs down oh, to us. So like one, at one do. point, they're yeah. taking care of something, and yeah. next thing you know, hey, we'll let the states take well, care right. of that themselves. That's and right. The states and, do and, that to the towns. Well, and the states have, the states have really done it to the towns. Um, yeah. We had something uh, when I served as town manager here in Warren. Um, uh, they set up this scheme called the state aid roads. You know, where um, roads that the state had always taken care of, they uh, they they threw back to the town. They, and that was one of the reasons why we set in 1972 we set up the uh, municipal revenue sharing plan. But now they've taken that money away. And they rated uh, that, yes. But the town still has to take care and of it. And both road. Democrats yeah. and Republicans rated uh, revenue sharing. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, Baldacci started governor, some of that. Governor Baldacci started it. He, he yeah. rated it, I believe, 10 or 20 percent, and LePage then rated it by 80 percent. But what you're also addressing is something very serious regarding our local school boards and boards of select men and women. They're the ones on the front lines of receiving the criticism. And it's totally unfair that they should be the ones receiving, you know, they get the back end of this that uh, all of a sudden, hey, my property taxes went up. It's your fault. Well, it's not, it's not their fault. It's the fault of the federal government uh, handing it back to the states and then the states trying to find solutions to that. So they end up handing things back to the town. And then the, uh, uh, so the Board of Selectmen and the school board, you know, you, you feel sorry for the position they put in. Um, you know, they have to 
raise the money to take care of our kids and have our schools. And the towns have to plow our snow and take care of the roads. So that's true. You'll have a citizen go to city hall and yell at them. You know, I want you to see you cut two million dollars right. out of the budget. It's like, well, do you not want your roads plowed well, next it. week? That's and, it. And roads and, are the majority. Of and with the schools, they budgets. have so many mandates on. Right. You know, for example, you know, special education oh, yeah. and things like that. Really they expensive. really can't cut they in can't. some areas. No, some of yeah. it's federally mandated. They yeah. have to. So that's why uh, Representative Pluker and I introduced bills um, targeting the fifty-five percent education and also the municipal revenue sharing. It's targeting the shifts, basically. We are targeting yeah. the shifts, and we're telling our local school boards and our boards of select men and women that we've we've heard you uh, we're trying to address it we're trying to get you the relief and also Dan you, you brought up a really good point regarding the regressive uh, bent towards um, what went on with the LePage administration where you know cutting the the only real progressive tax we have is the income tax and um, you know it's the ability to pay you make more money you pay more money um, nobody likes paying taxes but as uh, uh, Justice Holmes once said um, your taxes are the price we pay for civilization and um, you know we've got to have some system um, to, to take care of ourselves so um, uh, the, the shift uh, to people on fixed income is just totally unfair and boy we hear it at the doors uh, the leading two concerns uh, knocking on the, the doors uh, during this campaign season was um, Number one is health care, uh, how unfair and unaffordable it's become. That, and I believe health care is a universal human right, and uh, we're going to have to solve it uh, with some kind of a national health care plan. Canada, Great Britain, all the other European countries uh, have this. We don't. Um, and uh, our health care industry is uh, it's, it's all about money. Uh, we know that. And, you know, uh, President Truman in 1949 um, introduced national health insurance uh, single-payer health care plan he got slaughtered by the American Medical Association at the time there was a big um, Joseph McCarthy and Nixon and all that anti-communist socialist stuff and they accused uh, Truman of being a communist because he was doing uh, national health insurance but you know we already have Social Security so you know I want the folks to know that um, uh, we already have socialized medicine. I know no one wants to use that word, but um, anybody over 65 years old and all veterans already have uh, national health care. Um, they go and avail themselves to the system, and uh, it doesn't cost anything uh, or practically uh, nothing. And, uh, but it's the rest of us that don't. And uh, anyone who is uh, going through an experience and, uh, with the co-pays and uh, the deductibles, you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, the Obamacare uh, solution uh, really didn't work very well. Um, the premiums are not affordable any longer. The deductibles are too high. And we need uh, a national uh, solution. Last night, the Knox County delegation met with uh, the All Care Group, um, uh, uh, which is uh, a movement uh, afoot uh, across uh, all states to recognize that we need um, a national health insurance system, whether it happens on a statewide state basis. My own feeling is it has to happen at the national level. I think if we bring our troops home, uh, um, stop the military empire business, um, as Dr. King said in 1967. Um, you know, a country that would spend more on military empire than uh, the uplifting of its people is, is uh, approaching uh, moral bankruptcy. And um, you know, we got a real problem where you know trillions and trillions of dollars. So we spent a trillion dollars in Afghanistan, and the Taliban now control 60 percent of the country. Yeah. Um, you know, that one's not going to end well. Um, and when we commit those kind of resources overseas with no results, when our own people at home are suffering, uh, that's, that's not a satisfactory situation it's at all. Hopefully the next presidential cycle um, will resolve some of this, some of the candidates will be willing to take it on, but it takes a lot of courage. Uh, to deal with those things. Um, it does seem like uh, even Democrat or Republican, uh, when it comes to these wars, nobody wants to be the person who, you know, lost the war or pulled out of the right. war or surrendered the war. Right. So you end up with this kind of Vietnam phenomenon that's where right. it just sort of goes on forever. It does, and, uh, and, and that's what, you know, unfortunately we lost uh, 58,000 uh, men and women in Vietnam and, uh, you know, we ended up uh, with that lasting image at the American Embassy with the the helicopters yes. uh, leaving and people hanging from the bottom of the helicopters and you know the next two years weren't, weren't very pretty in Vietnam there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of serious retaliation for the side that sided with the Americans but President Eisenhower in 1953 um, gave a very famous speech it's called his cross of iron speech but he, he said that you know every every major fighter jet that we build is, is two hospitals we don't build it's it's 20 bridges 
And uh, it's a speech that uh, everyone should uh, revisit. Just Google Cross of Iron Eisenhower and it will come up and you'll say, wow, the, uh, our leading general from World War II that uh, helped us defeat the Nazis in Germany um, uh, makes this speech as a civilian. You know, I want people to recognize that um, after President Eisenhower became a civilian and became president, he never once put the military uniform back on. He said that the uh, military uh, is subservient uh, in the Constitution to a civilian government, and I'm a civilian, and I'm going to do what's right for my nation. And uh, he did a great thing, and uh, he also, his farewell address, he, he warned the nation of an un unaccountable military-industrial complex and the threats that it posed to our democracy in reference not only to the amount of money that was being diverted, um, but um, the implicit threats that it uh, had to civilian government. And I think we saw that play out uh, in 1963 to 1968. And don't get me started on that one. I was going to say, I can already see the comment thread uh, growing below this uh, video, but uh, all interesting stuff. Uh, I really appreciate you coming in today, Jeff. Thank you very much, Dan. All right, it's thanks. always good to see you. Thanks. All right. And uh, thank you guys for watching. And uh, remember, you can watch all of our uh, Knox County uh, Village Soup interviews on knox.villagesoup.com. If you go up to the tab that says Watch, you can scroll down to Behind the News, and they're all there. If you'd like to send in a comment or a thought or a question or a suggestion for somebody we can interview, just email us at news at villagesoup.com. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you very much.